we're here. We're we're still talking about movies, which is something that I should probably I probably I should probably do more of on this channel. Once again, I conquered English. Ryan right the ass. All, all right. I swear there's no alcohol in this. I swear I didn't put anything in it. I don't drink. I have a shit liver, um, which makes me a very um, boring person in real life. I don't, I hate bars. I hate the atmosphere that bars have. All these people screaming and having these drunken conversations about politics. It's disgusting. God. Um, timer's on. Here's a movie that... <laughs> Here's a movie that everybody should love, and if you don't love it, we can't be friends. Um, Ingmar Bergman's Persona, my favorite Bergman movie, um, one of my favorite movies ever, and yeah, I mean, there's a review, there's a very, sh there's a very rough review of it. I, I watched my review again of this movie just in case I said something that I really disagree with, and I, it's, it was my problem with that review wasn't necessarily that it was mostly that. Um, I, I was talking in a really stiff way in that video. I, I wasn't really sure why. Um, but anyways, it's great. Revolutionary editing, revolutionary storytelling, revolutionary, um, cutting the scenes, revolutionary weird montage bit in the middle of the film where the film reel burns itself up and you see a bunch of really disturbing imagery. And it's basically... Bergman, like, turning the camera towards you, saying, Ha! Fuck you! That's basically what he's doing, and it's great. I love it. It's so exciting. Stylistically, this might be his most exciting movie, because it's re it really feels like he he watched, like, a bunch of French New Wave films and thought, Okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can totally do that. And he did it. And it's probably better than most of those French New Wave movies anyways. Um, yeah. It's great. Uh, what is there? A visual essay, great. Love visual essays. And uh, new interviews with Liv Ullman, uh, Paul Schrader. I know Paul Schrader and like Bergman had like a thing going on. And, but the do, do. Liv and Ingmar, a 2012 feature documentary directed by Diraj Al Kolkar. That guy. And that's got. I've. Always been very interested in their relationship. I probably shouldn't be. I know it's almost like borderline celebrity gossip, but still, it's interesting to me. And okay, on set foot on set footage with audio commentary by Berlin historian Brigitta Steen. So yeah, that's enough. That's that that makes me happy. Love this cover. Very ominous. Very simple. Very to the point. And very much so like this movie. Um. I can probably say more about it, but there's, like, a whole review of it. And it's been a while since I've seen it in full. So, yeah, I can't really... I, 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 I'll, t I'll say that... I'll tell you this. It, um, despite being very... Despite the film being very artsy and... Um, to some, maybe, pretentious, it's also an extremely heart-wrenching movie. Uh, when it comes to the human condition about being lonely. About being scared of life and people and just trying to accept yourself in that situation in that climate it's a very good film on when it comes to that theme as well um here's another movie that i love the piano teacher mikhail haneke um best rape scene ever <laughs> best rape scene ever maybe um it's up there it's up th i'll say this though first of all I know this is, like, one of the most popular images from the movie. I'm not sure if... I, I feel like the Criterion Collection could have done better still. And the special features on this Blu-ray kind of sucks. It, it's, it's got, like, an interview, some behind-the-scenes footage, selected scene commentary featuring Huppert, which... That, that's, like, the best part of this entire... A special feature list, like, okay, there's a new interview with Haneke, there's a new interview with Cooper, which is always great, but there's no making a documentary, and that's about it. So, they could have done better. They could have done better. I'm not sure Haneke is, like, a big fan of making making of documentaries, but still, I, I feel like they could have done better. But I, I don't regret buying this. Still. Because I, I do really, really love this movie. And 
it's a sad film. I, I probably said it in that uh, favorite movies um, series that I did. It's an extremely sad movie because the th because throughout the whole film, there is a woman who has this one desire, this very screwed up. Well, screwed up's not really right. Where she has a very extreme desire to do certain very extreme things, and there's this person that comes her way that might fulfill that. But at first, she's like, "Oh no, stay away from me. I want to be private." But he's like, "No, I will fulfill that your desires," and then he does, and then she realizes that she hates it. At the end, and that's the worst. That's got to be the worst feeling. Like throughout your life, you wanted this one thing. Finally, it comes your way. At first, you're hesitant, but then you accept it, and you realize you hate it. And your whole life was a goddamn lie, and you want to die. That's basically this movie. If you feel like that, watch this movie. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure if I sold it to anybody, but. Uh, let's talk about a less depressing movie where a bunch of girls disappear at a picnic. Picnic at Hanging Rock. Now, here's what's so great about this little mini box set thing. So basically, it's got the DVD. Um, it's got like a Blu-ray and DVD thing going on. So you got the Blu-ray, you got the DVD. Maybe you don't have a Blu-ray player, you can buy this and just watch the DVDs. As, uh, DVDs. I can't do that because the DVD region coding for Korea is different uh, from America. But here's the reason, here's the, here's another thing they, that they give you if you buy this. They give you the book. They give you the fucking book. That's kind of insane, honestly. And I do appreciate that, though. I will read it. I want to, maybe there's more. Maybe, like, Peter Weir intentionally left out some details from the book to make the film more mysterious. Um, but yeah, this movie's great. Um, the fact, just the fact that they disappear... And you never learn why, and you never learn what happens. They kind of hint at something, like they're they're like the movie kind of hints at these two guys that maybe they've done something to them. But no, it never fully answers anything. And at the end, you're just like, "Well, fuck." So, and it's scary because that kind of happens in real life. Sometimes people just disappear, and you never learn the why. And the scary thing about that is, of course, that it might happen to you. Um, but yeah, this is, I like this cover. It's a solid cover. It's not, it's nothing special, but like the color scheme of it, it's basically like the serene moment before the chaos strikes, which, um, makes it more, makes the doom that much more impending. Um, yeah, the color scheme of this movie is great. The color scheme, the lighting that makes everything feel so worn, which contrasts with, with, it contrasts with what's, what actually happens. And the acting by all the girls. It's insane how good they are. Like, especially the one girl that actually comes back from the disappearance. Like she comes back and she's like totally not sure how to react to everybody freaking out about the whole situation. It's a great movie. Love it. Um, I, I don't remember the film being sensual. Um, that might have been an aspect of the film. I'm not really sure. But, like, early Peter Weir movies, they're pretty good. Um, like, this was before, like, Dead Post Society and The Truman Show, and I'm not a big fan of Dead Post Society. I am a big fan of The Truman Show, but still, this is when he was weird. This was when, when he was like, you know what, I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want, and you're gonna eat my goddamn shit, motherfucker. It's great. Love it. Love the fact that he decided to just punk the entire audience and say, this, the point is that you don't know what happens. Because that happens in real life, and that makes it scary. Um, okay, if you haven't seen this movie, I'm not even sure why you're on this channel. The Princess Bride. I'll be honest with you, though. When I first saw this movie, I liked it, and that, that was the end of it. I did not get why everybody was freaking out about this movie as much as they were. And then I saw it for the second time with my cousin when he was maybe like seven or eight years old. And that was when it really clicked with me. I was like, oh, this is what the film is trying to do. This is what the film is trying to convey emotionally to kids and pe people who are becoming adults. Um, and it's just... There's almost a purity to it. 
almost like a pure storytelling element to it, because it's literally a, like an old guy telling a kid a story. So it, it's, it, it doesn't feel pretentious at all at any moment. The film's actually really short, like it's 98 minutes, so there's never a moment where it gets boring. Um, it, it's, it, there's never a moment where the film becomes needlessly clever. It's just a story. It's a fairy tale. And it's filled with characters with intentions that are just straightforward. It doesn't play with them. It doesn't make them overly complicated. They don't give them overly complicated backstories. No, they're just like, these are characters. They have a purpose. They're trying to pursue them. That's it. There's nothing more to say. It's just a story that's watertight. And it's great. It, it really is just a great tight movie and I do love the cover that that's beautiful that's really pretty and here's the thing in the back like if you if you open this it says as you wish come on you, that I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff and look at this stuff man it's like it actually looks like a it actually looks like a store look at that come on that that's cool Come on, that, that's amazing. There's a reason why, like, this is up there with, like, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and all those movies as films. That, like, old movies that kids, even to this day, uh, like, watch without thinking of, like, oh, it's an old film. No, like, this film is timeless. Because the story is timeless. Because the characters are timeless. Because the way they wrote the characters are timeless. And Billy Crystal is funny. Um, and yeah, like, a bunch of like, stuff about the movie. Like, I think there's a making of the documentary, right? There is a making of the documentary. Is, is there a making of the documentary? There is. Um, do, uh, the, uh, there's, I, okay, maybe there isn't. But there's, there's, like, five behind-the-scenes videos with commentaries by uh, Reiner and Crystal. Billy Crystal, that... So there's like a lot of stuff that Billy Crystal did for the special features for this one. So I'm I'm excited for that. I know I, I, I like Billy Crystal. I think he's really funny. I think he's I think he's also a very underrated actor. Um so yeah, the Princess Bride. It's great. Probably you should probably watch it. It's pretty good. Here's a movie that every angry teenager should watch and all then reevaluate their life choices based upon this movie. Quadrophenia. Now, I've reviewed this movie, and I'll be perfectly honest, I still haven't listened to the album. I probably should. There's a lot of music to listen to, man. Sometimes you just don't necessarily want to listen to the album that you need to listen to. And I technically don't need to listen to it. I just kind of feel like I have to because I love the movie. And anyways, Quadrophenia. Again, what can you really say about the movie? It's it's a movie, again, it's very similar to The Piano Teacher. It's a movie where you, there's a character pursuing something. Pursuing this idea, this image, this group, this headspace. And then he gets there and he realizes all these people, all these ideas that he was idolizing, they're actually just really, they're just losers. They, have, they also have no idea what the hell to do when shit hits the fan and he kind of needs to accept that okay so my voice became really weird for a moment there um, I'm going to stop the timer just for a bit okay Whew, that that does not feel good uh, I, I'm sorry if I I'm going to disturb a few people here I do have a runny nose not a runny nose I have a stuck uh, my nose kind of stuck up one, two, three. <sighs> that was disgusting. And it's going to be in the goddamn video because I don't care. This channel has never been too PC, in my opinion. I'm not above disgusting people with my bodily fluids. That came out wrong. Okay. We're back. We're going to talk about quadrophenia. A movie about a guy who's stuck in life, like my nose. That was a terrible. That's not even a joke. That was just a terrible thing to say. Um, so what about the what about the special features though? Because I, there's a review for this. There's a very lengthy review. That I've talked a lot of stuff about. Um, a lot of people seem to, seem to like it. 
I appreciate that. There's like a new interview with um, um, the producers, the Who's co-manager, new interview with the Who's sound engineer, and not necessarily like a making of documentary, but just like a bunch of like BBC series stuff, like TV episodes and TV interviews and whatnot. There is a youth culture program that, that was about the mods, you know, the, the group, the mods. Um, you know, the mods as a culture and whatnot. Um, that might be interesting. I do like the cover. Like, okay, are these the lyrics? Can you see the real me? Yes. Okay, so these are the lyrics. This does look kind of, it kind of almost looks punk. I love it. I, I love the fact that it's like a target towards him. That makes it, that, that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, Parafenia. Again, if you're like an angry teenager, that's perfect. That's a perfect movie for an angry teenager. It, it, it will also make like an angry teenager have, have an existential crisis, which is amazing. Uh, which is always great. Um, whew, that is, that is a pretty bad phlegm right there. No amount of orange juice is going to fix this. Let's go back to some of the Asian, the great Asian cinema of the past. Rashomon. Again, I made a review of it. But I, like, I know this is based on a story. I know this is based on, like, a short story or whatever. But the fact that Akira Kurosawa, because I think this is, like, I'm not sure if this is his debut film. Is it, is it his debut movie? Um, it's, like, one of his, like, early, 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 early work. But the fact that he decided to make a movie that was that that was basically revolutionizing storytelling in general, the fact that you can use multiple flashbacks, that you can use multiple perspectives, and that you can reconstruct a single story and make an entire extremely human and haunting mystery out of it, it's. And it's very minimalistic. Like when you when you think of the settings of the film, there's like the setting of that uh, like broken down, burned down like castle door that you know the, you know the three main guys are talking talk to each other with about the whole thing that happened. Then there's this there's the forest where the whole event whole event they're t talking about actually happened. And then there's the setting where they're like being judged. I think that's like the only three settings in the entire movie. And it feels like the movie's talking about the entire human condition. It's like the film is talking about the entire world. And again, it looks gorgeous. And it... Man... Toshiro Mifu and him, like, he was a force of nature. Like, he was so rugged, he moved like an animal. Like, just like... He moved like a guy who never learned... He, who who was never taught how to be how to have manners, like he was just like just walking around like this. And I'm not sure if it was it was, it was an intentional choice. Maybe it's the, it's the actual way he walks or whatever. But it makes him seem like such a loose cannon. And in this film, it that works. And in almost every Akira Kurosawa movie that he started, in, that worked for him. Um, but yeah, love this image. Lo I I think this is like an original original, um, you know, I think this image has been used before, but the fact, I love this image because, you know, it's like, you know, different stories are kind of like, you know, separating this one guy into different personalities or whatever. This is great. Love it. Absolutely love it. And love this movie too. Everybody should see it. What is there? There's like a, okay, a 68 minute documentary on the film. That's exactly what I live for. Um, excerpts from the world of Kazuo Mi. Yagawa, a documentary on Rashomon's cinematographer. Um, yeah, the cinematography in this movie is pretty good, especially in the forest, um, which is where like most of the really big cinematography happens. And an interview with Robert Altman on the movie. Did not know he was a fan, although I, I'm pretty sure like most film directors are a fan, are a fan of this movie because that is that good. And we've only got two minutes left, so this is probably going to be the last movie I'm going to talk about in this video. So I think this is going to be an eight-parter as a whole. And this is also a movie that I have not seen, and that th this might shock you. I have not seen The Red Shoes. I have not seen The Red Shoes, 
And like I said, I have not seen, I probably haven't seen a single Poe and Pressburger movie ever. Which is something that I will be fixing with this and this. So, yeah. Uh, I've seen scenes from this movie, though. And the colors look amazing. I've seen scenes from Poe and Pressburger movies, and they all look amazing. So I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to this movie, this, it, it, like, even this image alone is just, you know, that image alone is just like, God, it's so pretty. Um, I know it's about dancers. I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll have, like, a really existential edge to it or whatever. But, what, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Obviously, there's, like, an audio commentary with, uh, feet. Okay, an audio commentary by film historian Ian Christie featuring interviews with stars Marius Goring. Mo Moira, Sh oh, oh, she's in this. I didn't know she was in it. This um, cinematographer Jack Cardiff, composer Brian e Easdale, and of course Scorsese because I know he loves this movie. Um, profile profile of the rest shoots a, a documentary on the making of the film. Things that make me have very, very, very wet dreams. Um, and yeah, video interview with um, director Michael Pohl's widow. <laughs> That got that got that got kind of dark and just like a bunch of stuff, man. Oh, an animated film of Hein Heckrod's painted storyboards. An animated film based on the storyboards of this movie. That's gotta be interesting. And the timer just ended. Uh, shut up, please. And I, I'd love to. I, I can't wait to see this movie because I know so many people love it. Like, almost anybody who likes movies loves, it, loves this movie. So, yeah. I'll probably love it, too. I've heard people who... I've heard people say that they actually cried watching this movie just because it was so pretty. I'm not sure if I'm going to be included in that list, but maybe. Maybe. Who knows? I am a very emotional person. So, yeah. This is probably going to be an eight-parter. We've gone through 75% of what I bought. And even... Even if this was the last video, it would have still been a, a crazy amount of money that I've used. But still, a, this is a good time to make mistakes, as a certain friend of mine had told me. Um, that might be like the shittiest life quote to ever use, because then you start you just make mistakes all the time when you're young. So like, well, it's a good time, or, or whatever. I'm sorry to whoever told me that quote. I'm sorry. I don't. I didn't want to be mean. I'm just tired and I'm sick. Uh, uh, there's no good way to end this one. Bye.